Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of High Energy Girl. And today's amazing guest is Dr. Nick Bitts, who is an expert on anti-aging. We do a deep dive into the latest discoveries in aging research and lifestyle and behavior recommendations based on that research. We talk about growing science, about senescent cells, and what we can do to reverse them within our bodies and literally like turn back the biological clock. So I'm super excited, stay till the end because he does have a product with a promo code to help you save 15% off of the product you only need to take one time to see the results. So let's go and say hello to Dr. Nick. Hey everyone, welcome to High Energy Girl, a podcast helping women to age stronger because it is never too late to get fit, be strong, and feel sexy. I'm your host, Tracy Gluhide, health coach and personal trainer and founder of highenergygirl.com. Each week we will either have a guest interview which will provide you encouragement or an actionable tip to help you age stronger, or I will do a solo episode. Please also join our awesome Facebook group called High Energy Girls, and I'm looking forward to see you on the inside of that group and hope you enjoy today's show. Sleep is completely underrated, and so many women our age struggle with a really solid night's sleep. You wanna know how I fixed it for me? Well, one of the things I did was I got a chili pad because I was always too hot and I'd be like tangled up in my covers, kicking them off, pulling them on. I could never find that sweet spot temperature. You know, the whole Goldilocks thing, too hot, too cold. And then I got a chili pad. My husband has his own control. I have mine, so I keep mine way cooler than he likes it. I'm never overly hot anymore. It is fabulous. And I even use it all winter long because you can adjust the thermostat any way you like. And I really love the white noise, the little hum that it plays. So the Chili Pad Company, which is called Chili Sleep, has lots of amazing new products. They have pillows, bed sheets, weighted blankets, and the old fashioned mattress protector chili pad that I have. It is amazing. So for a special discount price, head on over to bit.ly forward slash chill sleep, C-H-I-L-L-S-L-E-E-P. And you will be thanking me later. Hey, Nick, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Hey, Tracy. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I'm excited to learn. I, I feel like you are just a wealth of knowledge to help us age and health. So for the listeners that don't know who you are yet, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah. So uh, my name is Dr. Nick Bitts. Uh, I'm a naturopathic physician. I um, specialize in all things integrative medicine, uh, but I definitely focus on Ayurveda uh, that's really the lens through which I see the world and through which I, I practice healthcare. Um, I've been in the dietary supplement space for quite some time, uh, have formulated for many companies. Uh, currently, I'm working with a company called Neurohacker Collective, um, which has been an amazing experience, very um very eclectic group of individuals from all different walks of life, all very big minds. Um, and, and they're wanting to, um, really just shift the dietary supplement space from the inside out. Um, so truly leading with science. I know people say that all the time. Um, sometimes it's true. Um, oftentimes it's not, um, it's, it's marketing first, um, we're certainly a science first company. Um, we, we create some very interesting products. We're very well known, uh, in the nootropic or the brain health space. Um, we're also very well known in the longevity space. So we make products geared towards healthy aging and such. Perfect. And, um, so why first let's start at the beginning. So why are your Veda? Why Ayurveda? I mean, I, it's, it's been a long, um, 
just really a long time coming. I, I was always interested in medicine, um, even as a little boy. Um, but I, I think it all began with uh, a health accident when I was about 12. I fell out of a tree, um, uh, severely hurt my back. Uh, I was paralyzed for about five minutes. Um, and, and I can still um, vividly recall that day. Uh, even now. And, and so losing all of your sensation, you know, in your, in your fingertips and your toes, and then slowly feeling the sensation start to come back and the energy start to move back into your core um, was a very um, mind blowing thing for a young boy who thought he was immortal and could live forever. Um, and so that really started me on the journey of alternative medicine. You know, I, at that time, I, I went to all of the allopathic conventional physicians and, and practitioners that I could to try to get a diagnosis and try to feel better. But I had this nagging back pain that I couldn't get rid of um, in sciatica. And sciatica is just debilitating when you have it chronically and, um, and very fulminant, very, very intense. Um, and so I, I basically out of desperation, uh, desperation, I discovered a traditional Chinese medicine, which opened my, my eyes to kind of Eastern philosophies. Um, you know, I got immediate reprieve from acupuncture, uh, as well as botanicals. And, uh, and, and from that, I think it just steered me away from the allopathic, uh, the strictly Western viewpoint of medicine, where the body is, uh, is a set of different systems and we only work at one system at a time and they're all separate. And we have a, a pharmaceutical that can treat a certain pathway. And, and you know, it's a very, um, and, and again, not without value, but it's very limiting, I had, I had found. And the Eastern philosophies are much more personalized um, and they're much more um, about self-care. And so there are things that you can do day in and day out to take care of yourself. And so I think from traditional Chinese medicine, um, I, I got excited about Ayurvedic medicine, which comes from India. Um, Ayurveda is uh, a medicine that's, that's 5,000 years old. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. You know, some say 3,000 years old. Um, regardless, it, it is a very old form of medicine, and it's thought to be the mother of all medicines. Um, but it's much more than just a medicine uh, that, that's all about diagnosis and treatment. It's really a way of seeing the world. Um, and so I got just fascinated by the five elements and, and how the universe started and how that um, impacts us. Um, uh, through, through every phase of life and, and especially as it relates to health. Um, and so I started practicing yoga, which is the sister science of yoga, uh, of Ayurveda. They're, they go hand in hand uh, philosophically. And for me, it just really worked. I was able to uh, really heal, heal myself through the application of Ayurveda and yoga. Um, I did live in India for a short stint. Uh, plugged into an Ayurvedic uh, hospital there where I worked. Um, and I, I found a mentor who, who was able to teach me. And, and so that just became my passion. Um, and I, I, I still practice it personally. Um, I still preach it uh, to everybody that I can because it's been invaluable in my life. Cool. And where are you located? So I'm in Southern California presently. Yeah. Born and raised in Colorado, um, lived uh, for a decade up in Seattle when I was studying medicine. And then I found myself um, in Orange County presently. Okay, cool. Uh, my middle son lives in, he just moved from West LA to Valencia. Um, but we live in the South Bay area on a small, like, you know, little farm. And so he grew up in the country and then he went to LA and just hated it. And now he's in Valencia and he's happier. So yeah, LA is not for everybody. Uh, you, you certainly can find your people and you can find an area that you love. Um, but the traffic for me was, it was just awful. And when I had my, my daughter, you know, we were walking to the beach in Santa Monica and we were stepping over homeless people. And, you know, there were hypodermic needles all over the place. And, you know, I just had the realization that that wasn't a place that I wanted to raise children. 
Um, and so, but I wanted the sun, you know, I didn't want to move back to Colorado or Seattle. So I just ventured South and Orange County has been uh, really good to us so far. That's exactly what he says. Cause he was, he lived in Santa Monica. He's a yep. runner. And he said, I'm just, I just hated running and having to dodge homeless. And he said something about the needles, which I just can't even imagine what that would be like. Um, so that's funny. Okay. So then you, you went to India and you got fully immersed in Ayurveda. What type are you? Oh, what body type am I? Yes. Um, so why don't body you typing... first explain, why don't you first explain what those are and then you can. Yes. Remember. So body types are, um, they're fundamental to the Ayurvedic philosophy. Um, I think that there's, um, a lot of misinformation too, when you talk about body types, um, I think people like to oversimplify this idea and say, I am only a Vata body type and that's, that's that. And now everything has to be uh, relative to Vata's and that's how I'm going to create health. And I think there's some value in that, but body types, um, are, are, are much more than that. You know, there are, in essence, there are three major body types that are Vata, Pitta and Kapha, but we all have aspects of all three of those body types, just in different ratios. Mm -hmm, right. And so the body types are made up of the five elements um, and without going too deep. Um, so the five elements from an Ayurvedic perspective is the element of space, which holds everything. Um, and then you have air that fills it. And then you have water, fire, and earth. And so it moves from this very subtle energy into a very dense energy. So mm -hmm. from space into earth and all of those five elements, they interweave and they combine in different ways. And in the body, when the most subtle elements combine the space in the air, that's Vata. And so Vata is known as really like wind. It's any movement in the body. People that are Vata lack the dense elements and they tend to be very thin frame. They tend to be very erratic in their thinking and their talking. Um, they tend to be very quick. Um, they tend to have nervousness, maybe some trouble sleeping because they, they have a predominance of those two elements, as an example. Pitta is fire and water. And so these are people that tend to have a lot of heat. They tend to be very fiery. They tend to be very sharp, sharp in terms of uh, their memory, in terms of how they assimilate information, in terms of how they speak. They tend to be very good public speakers. They tend to have very good digestive fire. Um, and then you have kapha on the other end, and they are the more dense forms. Um, and so they are the combination of water and earth. And so these are the people that are big boned. They're just naturally big, but they have very beautiful skin. They have a lot of the water element. Um, they can gain weight just by, 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 by breathing <laughs> air. You know, they just have that tendency. And so Ayurveda then is it's, you need to figure out your body type. And that's always the first step when you come into Ayurveda is really understanding that. And then there are questionnaires online to help people determine that. And, and, you know, there's a little bit of validity to them, but, but it's not the end all and be all. It really is much more important to work with somebody who's trained in Ayurveda and that really understands the intricacies of the medicine and the philosophy. Um, and, and I do think it's critical to work with somebody who does pulse diagnosis or even face and tongue diagnosis, um, because that really, uh, gives you this specific ratio of the Vata Pitta Kapha in somebody. And so when you know that, you know exactly what you need to do to stay healthy. And so it's believed that your body type is determined at the point of conception. And, and so that then becomes your mm -hmm. set point in life. And, and so the goal then is to stay at that set point. So Tracy, your set point is very different than my set point. Even though we might have a similar body type, our ratio is a little bit different, right? And so if you know your ratio, you know that you have a tendency to accumulate, as an example, vata, and you need to do things that are anti-vata. So the opposite of, and so that's what I love about Ayurveda. It's a medicine of opposites. 
And once you understand your body type, you know exactly what you need to do from an opposite standpoint to maintain that balance, to be present, um, uh, presently healthy or to be healthy in the future as well. Cool. Yeah, I love it. I went to an Ayurvedic practitioner that was my yoga teacher. And so she went to become an Ayurvedic practitioner and then she ended up going to the Chinese medicine route. Um, but I never went with her at that point. My current doctor I have right now is Chinese medicine acupuncture who does a lot of energy type work. Um, so I'm a hundred percent for, I haven't been to a real doctor since like 2019. <laughs> <laughs> a real doctor. Yeah. I, I hear well, you. Okay. I, that's wrong. I shouldn't have said that an allopathic doctor. Yeah. By Western standards, a real doctor. And, and, you know, I mean, not all doctors are great. Uh, when you when you get into traditional MDs, not a, all of them are great. When you get into more holistic medicine as well, not all of them are great. And so true. It, it does ring true, though, when you work with somebody on either end of the spectrum that's really good, it makes you a believer in, in that, that, that philosophy, that form of healthcare, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I go to my chiropractor every week because I'm very active and... I mean, I feel like he helps a lot too. I didn't realize how connected chiropractic was to other areas of your body. So are you still practicing in Ayurvedic right now? Um, I do consults on a one-to-one basis. I I do not um, presently work out of a a clinic. So I'm now full-time in the dietary supplement space. Okay. Um, but, But again, a lot of my training and philosophies and knowledge base um, is implemented in, in a lot of the formulations that, that I'm working on presently, which is, which is a nice blend of the clinical practice and the training into the present tense, creating tools for people that can take it into their homes and use it uh, for everyday healthcare. And I am a hundred percent all about aging. Okay. I'm 57 yes. and I want to age stronger and healthier. That is my big shtick is age stronger and healthier instead of sicker and weaker. And I am proof that even though I've been in fitness my whole life, well, I should say ever since college, um, you can get stronger even though you're getting older. And so that's what I want people to realize is that they are not, oh, you can't use that. Oh, I'm just getting old excuse. It's total BS. You can do what you want to do. So let's talk about that. Oh yeah. Aging. I have, so aging is a, a vast topic. I mean, we could start anywhere and do a deep dive. Um, I, I, you know, I think when you, when you talk about aging, it's important to define what is aging, I think. And it, it can be kind of boring. I think for a lot of people to be like, Oh, I don't want to hear a definition of aging. But, but it is, it's interesting because you need to go to what is the, where's the science, you know, where's the science leading us, where are they doing research and what's possible in the future? And I think that's, what's really interesting. And, and for me, that grounds it and makes it a very real concept. And I think where we are today, when we talk about aging from a a science research standpoint, we always talk about the hallmarks of aging. Um, and, and these nine, there's nine different hallmarks. These are the mechanisms that drive the aging process. And so over the last 30 years or so, we've been able to define these nine different mechanisms that underline, uh, underlie aging in, in pretty much all organisms, especially humans. Um, and, and these aren't isolated. They're not separate from each other. They're all interrelated. They're all interweaving. They're all connected to each other as well, which is really fascinating. Um, and I, you know, I'm particularly interested in cellular senescence right now, which is, um, I, I think it's probably the most buzzworthy area in the aging community presently. Um, I mean, you can read about it uh, everywhere online right now. There's a lot of biotech companies and pharmaceutical companies that are investing in this space. Um, and, and I think it's so interesting because it's very actionable, um, meaning we, we've defined what it is. And now we have these tools or uh, products or ingredients that can undercut that process in a very significant way. And the idea is that the, that these products can ha- can have amazing potential in the human body today, 
not you know a decade from now, but the science and the application of the science is current today. And so for me, it's a very exciting field. It's opening up just now. It is certainly early days, but but it is um, pertinent and very real today. So what is cellular senescence? Yeah, so so uh, cellular senescence, it's, it's funny because whenever I talk about it, I always feel like I can see everybody's eyes glaze over um, because it's such a... A, a technical term, right? And but but when you get to the core of it, um, the word senescence means to grow old, in essence, right? So senescence really is the process of aging. Um, cellular senescence then is the process by which cells grow old in the body. And so we've been able to define this process as cells that grow old, stop dividing and then just persist in the tissues. And it's that, that lingering effect of these dead cells that, that get lodged in our tissues and secrete these inflammatory chemicals throughout the body that are at the root of driving a lot of the, the, the aging process currently. So, so let, me, let me see if I hear what you said. Yes. Okay, if I'm hearing you correctly. So we know that every hour a mil- a million cells are renewing and dividing within your body, right? So are you saying that cells in this process are getting stuck and therefore not going through this renewal process, but just like getting stuck and like rotting within your body, something like that? You're close. And I, I love that you you got it. So, so we do, we have 37 trillion cells in the human body. 37 trillion cells, you know, and that's almost a one-to-one ratio to this number of cells that we have in our gut. It was thought that the gut far outnumbered the cells in the body, but the latest research shows that we're about a one-to-one, which is kind of neat. Um, And all cells, um, almost without exception, go through the same life cycle. And the, the, the kind of uh, timer or clock on cells are known as telomeres. Mm-hmm. And so cells, they, they, they divide and then they divide more and they divide more. And so it's thought that cells can divide about 50 times bef- before the telomeres shrink and then the cell just stops. And so um, every cell besides neurons, some of the cells in, your, in the lens of your eye um, and some of the peripheral nerves, they, they always are turning over. So you're, you made the point of millions every hour. And that's probably accurate. I know I read a, a stat recently that about 50 billion cells turn over every single day. Um, and so you're constantly, these cells are coming up and they're going through what's called apoptosis. And right. that's a word that just means falling off. So like yellow leaves falling off of a tree or fruit falling off of a bush or flowers falling off of a plant. Um, apoptosis is this idea of cells falling off of the body. So it's cell death. Is that so it's cell death. Exactly. It's programmed cell death. And so it's important that cells go through that. So they go, they replicate 50 times, um, and, and they, they move into that senescent, that aged stage, and then they go through apoptosis. However, the problem is when cells don't go through apoptosis. So there's, we're finding out that cells are able to resist apoptosis or program Ooh. cell death. And so they linger in the body. And so that's the problem. And so everybody's trying to figure out how do you go in then and, and basically get the cell back onto its normal life track so that then it goes through apoptosis and then the body can get rid of it and create new cells in its place. And that is the promise of senolytics, which is this idea of a senescence uh, and, and lytic, which means destroying senescence in the body. And there are certain compounds that can stimulate or induce apoptosis of these old dead cells that are in the body. So what's the difference between apoptosis and autophagy? Yeah, it's, it's funny. I get, I get asked that question a lot and it's because I think there's so much information and conversation around autophagy right now. Um, Autophagy um, basically means uh, to, to eat itself. So it's basically a cell repairing itself um, generally through uh, uh, enzymatic processes Um, And so cells um, use this process of autophagy to repair itself through cell damage. 
Um, and there's a lot of ways that you can push autophagy to make sure that cells stay whole and continue to function in the body. Um, but autophagy and apoptosis are separate, if that okay. makes sense. So cells, um, if, if you have enough autophagy and repair mechanisms, you don't reach senescence. If you lack that, eventually the cell will go into senescence, that kind of frozen state, state where it's not replicating anymore. Okay. So when that happens, you said it affects all kinds of other things in your body. It's like stuck there. So what does it do exactly? Yes. So, so these cells are avoiding apoptosis. So they, they, we tend to accumulate senescent cells um, as we age. And so we know people that are over the age of 50 have a very significant amount of senescent cells, not in any one tissue, but literally throughout the entire body. Um, in the skin, in the organs, um, in, uh, you know, I literally everywhere in the body. Um, and these cells, when, when they get lodged in a tissue, they become non-functional. Um, what happens then is that they, uh, they compromise the structure of the tissue as well as the function of the tissue. And, um, they also secrete what's called SASP factors which are senescence associated secretory phenotype factors. Um, in, in, in short, SAS factors are just these inflammatory compounds okay. that create inflammation locally within a tissue. And then they actually get into the bloodstream systemically and create this kind of chronic low grades uh, inflammation throughout the entire body. And that's and where so disease comes, right? Yeah. And so inflammation we know is intimately tied to the aging process. So it's proposed as, as a new hallmark of aging. So presently, we have those nine that I, I kind of, I, I spoke to earlier. Inflammation is not on that list yet, but it's been proposed as another hallmark. And so I think in the next year or two, you're going to, you're going to see inflammation as another hallmark of aging, another mechanism that drives the aging process. Interesting. Cause I, I've known about inflammation for a very, very long time. I'm surprised it's not on the main list. I don't know why it's not. Um, but there was just recently, uh, in, in early 2000, uh, sorry, 2022, there was a, a an aging convention in Copenhagen where they talked about a lot of the new science. Um, and they've identified five more hallmarks, um, two that I thought were very interesting. One is inflammation. The other one is microbiome disturbances. Mm. So again, emerging area, we're starting to understand how shifting the microbiome shifts the, the entire terrain of the, of the body and, and really can shift the aging process as well. So that I think might be another hallmark as well. What were the other three? Oh boy. I know, uh, uh, RNA, uh, splicing was one, um, protein, um, uh, 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 mechanical dysfunction. So in terms of how the proteins fold, and then I'm missing one as well. Okay. Um, super Those technical are... and, and hard <laughs> to even wrap my head around. Like, what does that exactly mean? Um, but yeah. the information in the, in the microbiome, I'm like, yep. Why aren't those already in the hallmarks of aging? We all know those, those influence the aging process for sure. Oh yeah. Especially the inflammation that is not yeah. new. I mean, I learned about yes. that in 2007. Right. So, okay. So now we know what the problem is. So what's the solution to these senescent cells? <laughs> Yeah. So great question that this is, I think where it gets really exciting because it's actionable. Um, we we've defined this problem, this mechanism that underlines the aging process, um, that, that, that is kind of neat and, and, and mind blowing in and of itself. But in 2015, um, scientists from, um, pretty amazing research institutes, uh, the Scripps Institute and Mayo Clinic, um, they reported for the very first time that there are compounds that have an affinity for finding senescent cells in the body and then convincing them to finish their journey to falling off, which is inducing apoptosis of those cells. And those scientists in 2015, they coined the term senolytic. Um, and I, I kind of kind of already spoke about it, but seno refers to senescence or aging, and then lytic means to destroy. And so these compounds destroy senescent cells in essence. Um, and so we've, we've discovered a whole range of these compounds that can decrease senescent cell burden in the human body 
as well as provide very functional benefits in the body as well, which is, which is really neat. Mm-hmm. How is it measurable? Yeah. So, so again, it is early days. Science scientists are trying to figure out how to measure uh, senescent cell quantity and load in tissues. Um, presently, there isn't a, a really amazing way to do it. Um, there, there, there are some interesting ways. Um, one is beta galactoside, um, which we know that senescent cells secrete this compound that we can actually go and measure in the body. So higher levels of that would be indicative of more senescent cells in the body. Um, but presently, the, uh, the best way to determine somebody's senescent cell load is through biopsy. Um, and so there are some studies right now where uh, people, uh, amazing people have volunteered to do muscle biopsies. So they do a muscle biopsy, they exercise, they take senolytic compounds and they show the before and after effect, uh, of senescent cell load using these compounds, which is quite a, quite remarkable. And what are you seeing? Yeah. So, so it depends. So they are seeing several things. So when it comes to, if we're going to talk about muscle biopsies, um, we know that senescent cells build up in muscles. And so it's thought that in part, the reason that we have, we being you and I, and everybody has trouble building muscle after the age of 40 is because we're replacing healthy tissue with these senescent cells in our muscles. And so um, we know that there's a compound as an example called Synactive, which is a blend of two different botanicals um, that uh, can undercut that whole process. They can, if you do a before and after, it can significantly reduce the amount of senescent cells. And so as a result, when you can get rid of those senescent cells from your muscles, you then are going to grow healthy, functional muscle cells that then, uh, in theory, can can grow and and do their job more significantly. So, what you're doing is you're basically reverting back to more youthful physiology, which is amazing. So, if I'm hearing you right, to start taking this compound, essentially, I will get stronger faster. Yeah. And, and I, I think that that's fair enough. So some of the early studies on senolytic compounds, it all started with a, a combination of desatinib, which is a pharmaceutical medicine and quercetin. Um, that combination um, ha- was really the first combination to show benefit. And when they um, basically when, when they looked at mice, that's where they started. When they looked at mice, they, they found that when you ingested these compounds, um, not only did the senescent cell load go down, but functionality increased. Um, so they were able to walk better. Um, you know, they, they, all of these, 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 these things that are very functional were the end result. So in terms of strength, I would say that, yes, that's, that's the promise of senolytics, because again, you're reverting back to more youthful physiology and you're, you're going to start, um, getting rid of these old cells and replacing them with new young cells. Okay. Well, that's, I'm, I do CrossFit. So (laughs) Um, that is one of my measures of health is if I'm increasing my gains, you know, each month. So that is, that's a really good measure, better than a biopsy. <laughs> For sure. You know, and I, we're, we're going to figure out how to do it. I think there's probably going to be some urine tests coming out. There's definitely going to be some blood tests. Um, but, but functional measure is, you know, functional outcomes is the most critical aspect, you know, because even if, if you're seeing shifts on blood work, it doesn't mean that you're having big gains that are functional and the outcomes are actually significant and meaningful. Right. Um, and so, you know, we, we've, we at Neurohack, we've recently created a product called Qualia Senolytic. That's a blend of nine different ingredients. Um, and so rather than relying on, um, kind of inconsistent, um, non-meaningful test results, we looked at outcomes. And so we, um, we tested individuals that took the product. Um, they took the product over the course of three months. 
um, and we saw an improvement of uh, activities of daily living and an improvement in joint stiffness, um, almost 50% across the board. Uh, so pretty, pretty remarkable. It just shows the product can have very significant results on a very global scale, which is cool. That's very cool. And honestly, I feel like when people see results from their going to the gym and their strength training, they're more motivated to continue. And, um, and I will say, I mean, I'm stronger now than when I was 10 years ago and I've always worked out always. So, but, but if this could even make gains faster, maybe with even more recovery is what I, I would guess. So what about other areas just besides like just muscle? I mean, where would you see, like my mom has like dementia. Um, do you have any connection with brain health? Awesome question. Yes. Um, yeah. So I think it really, the effects are not going to be consistent from person to person. It, it's, it's really contingent on your senescent cell load overall. And then where are you accumulating those senescent cells, which uh, isn't consistent across the board and, and certain people, it can be joints and other people, it can be the lungs or the heart and other people, it can be the brain, you know, and, and the brain is really interesting because, um, you know, 50% of the brain in short is neur our neurons and, and neurons don't turn over. You know, you have one set of neurons that you have throughout your entire lifetime. So they don't go through apoptosis. So they don't go through senescence. However, the other 50% of the brain are uh, supportive glial cells. Um, you know, there's four different types and they all serve different functions. They serve the neurons and the space surrounding the neurons. Um, and, and those do turn over. And so we know that those supporting cells can go through senescence. And so it, it is important to, um, to, to, to make sure that you're getting these senolytic compounds um, that, that can cross the blood brain barrier, you know? So one compound in particular would be turmeric. We know turmeric does cross the blood brain barrier very effectively, especially in certain forms. Um, and the thinking is that um, certain compounds such as turmeric then are gonna go in and really target the brain tissues. And, you know, brains age in part um, because of senescence. And so if you can get rid of that senescent cell burden in the brain, um, the thinking at this stage is that you can improve cognition, focus, memory, mood, all of these things. And so again, early days, I think we're going to get more research showing us what compounds, what dose um, has those benefits that we, we think are possible. Cool. So how long has Neurohacker been around now? I, I would say they've been around since 2015. Um, okay. and, and the brand's evolved quite a bit. Uh, I would say over the last three or four years, the brand has really found itself and created its foundation of products. Nice. So is this, um, is there other products that are part of like that started, where did they start? And then where are they now is the whole senescent area relatively one of their new product lines? Yeah. Qualia Senolytic is uh, a, a relatively new product. I want to say it's maybe six months old um, and it's, it's doing amazing. I mean, it's so unique in the marketplace. There's really nothing like it. Um, and, and it just flat out works. Um, so, so it's been cool to see the trajectory of that product over the course of a very small uh, period of time. Uh, but the product, I would say the, the brand itself is really built on uh, a product called Qualia Mind. Um, and it's a, it's a really big nootropic stack, um, really based in science, um, works um, unlike any nootropic out there. It's a, it's a, you know, there's over 30 ingredients pushing different pathways. Um, it's very felt. Um, and, and, and I would say that's our flagship to date. And that's why most people know us based upon that. We also have a product called Qualia Life. That's kind of an all purpose, healthy aging product. Uh, again, very robust um, from a formulation perspective um, and a benefit perspective, but it's geared towards cellular health specifically. 
Okay. Interesting. Well, I like the whole aging thing because let's face it, the boomers, I am just on like Gen X. Like I just missed the baby boomer generation by one year. Um, so I'm at the top of the Gen X, but let's face it. I mean, I'm 57. So that means the boomers are 58 and up and they don't want to get old. So I think it's really important that they realize that you're not too old. And it's never too late to do a 180 and change the trajectory of your health journey. So this sounds like it would be a big boost in that direction. Yeah. You know, I, th- I think so. Qualia Senolytic, um, one of the virtues I would say of the product, um, is that it is a a two day course. Um, so it's, it's akin to a, like kind of a detox. Um, it's short term. It's not a huge investment, um, of time or resources. It's just two days. And then you take a break for four weeks before doing it again. Ooh, Um, I like that. That's that's kind of the thought. (laughs) And, 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 and we didn't make this up. We're not doing this for the convenience of our customers. The reason that, um, that we're recommending the product in that way is because where we're seeing the studies go is into intermittent dosing which is, um, it's called the hit and run approach. So you hit the body hard and then you let the body relax. And so all of the studies to date, for the most part, have used that approach clinically, um, which is, which is, I think, very unique. You know, you don't find that using adaptogens or multivitamins or, you know, various other nutritional uh, compounds. But when it comes to senolytics, that's Shown, that's been shown to be the most beneficial, even more than continuous everyday dosing. So, so I, I like that because it's, it's just not a huge ask, you know, you just, and you can do it at any point, you know, you don't have this huge, um, detox reaction where if you do it in one day, you just feel awful that later in the day or the next day that doesn't happen with senolytics um, because it's, it's, you know, those cells are getting recycled and converted and grown into new cells. As it were, you're not then loading your, your amunctories or your, um, your detoxification pathways to get rid of these, these toxins. That's not how it works at all. And so you can use it really any day of the week, you can do it on a weekend. Um, and, and again, that the, the, the benefit is in, the outcome, the, the grand outcome. So some people have noticed benefits with joint. Other people have noticed benefits with their skin, with wrinkles. Others have noticed it with brain. Um, we've heard the whole gamut across the board, which is, which is kind of fantastic. And then how long would you take, like how many months or how many cycles until you really notice a result? Well, the hope is that one cycle, uh, one two day supply is going to give you exactly what you need. Um, again, early days, um, we, we don't know exactly the protocol that'll be recommended, uh, you know, 12 months from now, but we do know that it does take, um, weeks, if not months for senescent cells to reaccumulate. Um, and so in mice, you know, we've seen kind of a lingering effect when using senolytics up to about seven months. Um, so, you know, it, it, it maybe is even aggressive to do every single month, you know, maybe it's, it's more, um, advantageous to dose seasonally, you know, or maybe just one time per year. So I think it really just depends on the person. It depends on their vitality, the, you know, the strength of their vital force, um, their finances and all of that. But again, the, the proof is in just trying one round. Um, and then going from there. Um, and I've, I've been using the product for the last six months, um, every month. Um, and for me, it was even being, uh, relatively young. Um, it, for me, it was very felt from, from the first dose, which was, um, for me proof that, that it, that it worked for me. You know, it makes me wonder how many other supplements would only need to be dosed less than twice a day. You know what I mean? So many of the supplements I take, it's like twice a day, you know, and I'm, I, or some of them are even three times a day and I always skip a dose. I mean, it's like, it (laughs) never fails that I can't go that long. Um, you're spot on, you know, and I I will say when you look at the, the qualia products, our, our brand of products, we have a, a, you know, about 10 products to date 
almost all of them um, use uh, kind of intermittent dosing schedules. So we do five days on and two days off. Um, and I think that there's value in that. You're, you, we don't want to override the body's natural intelligence and just, you know, give the body too much of a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. I think that creates potentially more problems. And so it's important, I think, to give the minimum effective dose and, and to space it out so that you're just really normalizing physiology and, and supporting the body and allowing it to move in that direction rather than overriding it and hitting the body over the head with a hammer, a big hammer every single day. So I think there's, I think your statement, I think there's a lot of value in that. And, and we just don't know, you know, we, we don't know some things you need to dose daily, like adaptogens. I would, I would say to everybody, find an adaptogen that is uh, suitable for your body type that balances out the energies in your body and stick with it over the course of weeks or months, every single day, because adaptogens by definition are non-toxic. And they, they, by definition, they tend to have these accrued effects over time. And so what you find uh, with, I talk about ashwagandha all the time and I'll, I'll do it again here, but I take it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I am such an advocate of ashwagandha by the way, but, but if you take it for a week, you might have some benefit, but if you take it for six months, that's when you really understand the herb and you understand how it works in the body. And, and that's why I think when it brings the greatest benefits overall. What other adaptogens do you take? You know, I, I have really simplified and streamlined my, my protocol over the years. I think when I was in medical school, I think I, I tried everything. Um, and I, I, you know, I was in a bubble with like, like-minded individuals. I was fasting. I was practicing yoga four hours a day. You know, I was, I was like in it. And, and I think that I have certainly just stepped away from that and been like, okay, now I'm going to live in the world and simplify things, uh, in a way that, that, that works, still works, um, but is different. And so I, I, I have communed with ashwagandha for 20 plus years. It's, it's been, I would say the mainstay, um, you know, I do, uh, play with rhodiola every now and again. I like the, the felt response of that rhodiola is endangered right now. Um, and so it is critically important to make sure that you're working with somebody who is wild crafting it in a sustainable, uh, responsible way. So it's hard for me to recommend using rhodiola. Um, but, but again, all the adaptogens have different energetic properties and it's important to understand those rather than just be like, I'm going to choose a random adaptogen and I'm going to cross my fingers. I'm going to hope that it works. So, um, you know, when you look at ginseng or rhodiola or ashwagandha or shatavari or holy basil, they're all slightly different in terms of, are they hot? Are they cold? Are they stimulating? Are they calming? Are they oily? Are they drying? Do they have an affinity for specific organs or not? So each one has its unique characteristics Mm. and you need to understand those. Yeah. My doctor put me on ashwagandha. So I, um, I take that, but I want to do what you said. I want to simplify. I'm taking far too many supplements right now. And I think maybe I should start cycling and do some one day and some the next day and just alternate. So then that way I can start weaning off because I really feel that when you keep giving your body something, it feels like it doesn't have to do the work to make it itself, you know? Um, Like I know for a fact, glutathione, if you supplement with glutathione, then your body's not going to make it. But if you give it NAC, then it stimulates the production of glutathione, which, you know, is really important in detox, you know, properties. So I could talk to you all day. So how do we get some of this qualia senolytic? Yeah. So I think the best place is neurohacker.com. Um, it is present in the practitioner channel as well. So if there's any practitioners, uh, that are listening, you can get it on Emerson and full script. Um, but neurohacker.com is, uh, right now the best place to pick it up. Okay. I'm excited to try it because I, I love challenging my health, like myself in the gym and, um, And it's just such a good measure for me of what is working and what, you know, isn't. Um, 
So, oh, I have one more question and I, I'm running out of time, but I really want to ask you this really quick. What nutrition do you feel is helpful for supporting this product or this goal of aging? Yeah, I, I, that could be a whole nother podcast. Um, okay. Then I'll have to have you back. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just say this. I'll say this quickly. So if we're talking about cellular senescence, um, when you look at what nutrition, uh, what diets can be impactful for undercutting that, that process of aging, um, we know that a fasting mimicking diet, um, can be very beneficial. So low calories over the course of days or weeks, um, can really prime these senescent cells so that the body can then pluck them and get rid of them. And so there's not a lot of science in this area, but we do know that that is important. And we do know, of course, that, that fasting or low calorie diet, intermittent fasting, all of those things can support autophagy. And so even if a cell isn't at that stage of senescence, the theory then is that if you can induce autophagy through these low calorie diets, that the cell then can repair itself um, and, and sustain and, and move um, and not age in the way that you would hope. So. Okay. Yeah. I've had somebody on that wanted to talk about a kit or something about fasting, mimicking diet. And um, I just really prefer whole food. So yes. I'm not into buying anything in a package or a wrapper that, you know, so, yeah. um, but I know there's things that you can do out there. And so for the listeners, I'll do a little bit of research. I had a friend who did it with like avocados or something like that. And, um, I would also be curious to see how that would affect your strength in the gym. Um, do you know who Dr. Dominic Diagostino is? I do not. Okay. Um, he did some deadlift tests where he did a five day fast and then he went and he tested his deadlift and he was at the same. So that is pretty remarkable. Wow. Yeah. I mean, cause generally you would recommend very, um, low, uh, exertion when you're doing any kind of fast, just because you're not feeding the cells, the type of energy that they need. Um, but yeah. that is, that's, that is remarkable you know, and I, I will say, so if I, I, I always come from a very science standpoint, but I also come from the Ayurvedic standpoint as well. And Ayurveda would look at it as if we're talking just nutrition, um, of course you need to eat a body type appropriate diet. So if you're a Vata eat a Vata appropriate diet. Um, but I like to recommend a, a mono diet and, and it's a good, just cleansing diet. It's basically eating one food over the course of days or weeks. Um, and the goal isn't necessarily to fast the body. You're still giving the body fuel, but this specific diet, um, uh, it, it, it can really help the repair processes. And I think prime the senescent cells as well. And so, um, there's a dish in Ayurveda called kitchari or kitchidi. Yeah. I know um, what that is. Yeah. It's amazing. And it tastes so good. And so, uh, look up there's recipes all over, uh, the web, uh, the, the inner web as it is, uh, and find a good recipe. You can cook it, you can eat it, uh, two meals a day. Um, and, and just do that over the course of a week. And that can be remarkable in terms of its effects. Now is, so if you are, a okay. So what, what body type are you? So I'm predominantly Vata. Okay. What would you guess I am? Just, I mean, I already know what I am, but what would you just guess based on your experience today? I would say that you're a Vata Pitta. Okay. I've been told I'm a Vita Pata. Wait, Vita Pitta Vata. Yeah. So more Pitta, like I would say two thirds and one third. I think I remember that. That would make sense. And if I, if we were talking in the middle of summer right now, which we're not, it's the middle or the, the tail end of winter, I'm sure your fire element would be more present. And I would note that, but right now I think, you know, given the winter, your, your, your pitta, your fire, it naturally is uh, kind of tampered a little bit. And it's raining like crazy here. So it's cold. We have snow yes. across the street on the mountain. So it's like yes. not a normal day. <laughs> Well, listen, Dr. Nick, it has been a pleasure. Um, I'm really excited to try this product myself and see if I notice a difference and give some to my husband. 
So I just want to thank you so much for sharing this with us today. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Okay, everyone, that was totally awesome. So when you go to neurohacker.com, use the code high energy girl in all caps, and you will save 15% off. You will find the link in the show notes page at highenergygirl.com forward slash show. Thank you so much for listening. Let's go age stronger and healthier, and we'll see you next week. This podcast contains the opinion and thoughts of its host and guests. It is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subjects covered. All statements made on the podcast have not been evaluated by the FDA and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. If the listener requires professional assistance or advice, please contact your personal medical doctor. Both host and guests specifically disclaim any responsibility for any liability, loss, or risk personal or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence directly or indirectly of the use and application of any of the contents of these episodes. Like I said, this is my opinion and I could be wrong.